Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. And uh, can't believe time go go fast. It's the my last lecture, and I'm leaving right after the lecture. So I tried to um, save a few minutes in the end. So whoever has a question about the entire three lectures, feel free to ask. Okay. So to continue my uh, discussion on the nanomedicine challenge. To recap, we focus on the why the nanomedicine has been generating so much excitement. And mainly it's because of material property, which essentially you can talk about the multifunctional. You have the biphotonic properties. And whether you have organic, inorganic nanoparticles, there is a lot of thing field is still rapidly expanding. You also have this last one piece, which is EPI effect has generating it really becomes guiding principle for the cancer nanomedicine so far. And I, what I want to talk about, focus on this lecture, is really about the dark side of the EPR and uh, what's all the approach in the field, how to try to address these things. So let's go back to EPR. Everybody in the nanomedicine know what EPR is. Enhancement vital retention effect, essentially you have the nanoparticle travels through the circulation, you have the leaky vessel, you get a stick, you know, leak to the tumor. Now, you because of pulling fat drainage, it is trapped there. That's how you improve the nanoparticle delivery. That's called passive accumulation. But I think it's very important to look back to where the EPR was identified. There was many citation, over citation, over citation. What I found is a good practice, always go back to the first paper. So Matsuola Maida in 1986 came up with this concept this is actually EPR concept where it's coming up. It's very interesting. Today. What they discovered is when you're putting a statin drug, conjugate a large molecule with polymer, compare the drug alone. If you overlook about, uh, you know, the, about uh, 144 hours, you will see the molecular, single molecular drug of statin, there's no difference in terms of the tumor accumulation. However, as the time goes on, the nanopart, the, the large molecular polymer conjugated with statin actually increasing the tumor uptake. That's what the passive accumulation concept was originally proposed. So they did more than that. They did some very interesting mechanism study I found is still fascinating. What they did was Evans blue. Essentially they put Evans to blue, put albumin conjugate. So it's a nanoparticle, right? What they have shown is in this mouse model, it has very clearly, you can see the vasculature leakage was identified. After 72 hours, you can see the more accumulation there. But the lymphatic system, you can healthy one, after one hour, then 72 hours, everything clear. But in the tumor, it remains. So that's what the tumor leaky vessel and the poor lymphatic drainage was originally proposed. So that's, I hope, when you talk about EPI in the future, you will know where it's coming from. But EPR has, over-reliance EPR has become Achilles heel, I want to argue. And there is a soul search in the field try to address that. So the, there are three major problems of the EPR. First, the EPR effect is biased towards animal models. This is my friend uh, Jason Lewis in Slow Catering in New York. They did a very nice experiment. In this case, they took three prostate cancer cell lines completely different phenotype. There is a hypoxic house, there is a, you know, uh, lympho, lymph metastasis one, there are bone metastasis ones, there's completely different phenotype. They put all these three cell lines in the sub-Q tumors, in the mice, known mice, very simple. They grow the matching the size. Now you inject IV of uh, radio-labeled nanoparticles, essentially dextran. What they show is, in the beginning, you maybe see a different uptake, right? because of the, the, all the sum is very vascular, some is actually not. But over you know, 20 hours, they're exactly the same. Every single, dental, single tumor type gave you exactly the same 5% in dose per gram in that tube. So essentially, in the subcutaneous mice, you pretty much any nanopod you give, you have exactly the same uptake. Disregarding any, that there, so the bias toward animal model is, in, is one of the important features. Second one is really heterogeneous. There is not a true validation of EPI in human, although there is a plenty of effort to do that. Miramax in Boston, 
they actually have a clinical trial showing using the EPI effect to stratify the patient who are susceptible for the li liposomal drug treatment on, you know, versus there. They have shown some very promising result, but so far this field is still valid, still need to be validated. So essentially the EPI effect in human is very heterogeneous. So if you look at this classic paper by Harrington, in the head neck cancer, oral carcinoma model, they can achieve with the Indian labeled uh, liposome, they can achieve as high as 53 inject dose per gram. But in the breast cancer, the maximum is 3.9. So how can you think about EPI effect with nanoparticle can be applied to any cancers? That's a very big challenge, right? If you look at this recent example by Anderson Group in Denmark, um, what he did with the copper 64 liposome, what he showed is in the canine patient, these are not the model, but the canine patient, which is the dog patients. If you look at this, in general, sarcoma is much, much less uptake than the carcinomas. That's one. However, even between the carcinoma, different, different dog, the accumulation is very different. Not only that, in this particular case, individual dog with a carcinoma, you have totally demanded multi-foci of tumor, and each of them has some very, very heterogeneous intra to the animal, like there is a heterogeneity in terms of the accumulation. So this really gave you a sense on the heterogeneity of the one compared to animal model is, you know, animal model is only a model, so you have to really keep that in mind. The third one I want to talking about is really complexity of tumor microenvironment. Is as the nanoparticle goes through the bloodstream, well, certainly everyone in nano know there is a protein corona. You actually have to, major problems through the IV is you have off-targeting accumulation. And these are the liver, spleen, bone marrow, the EP, you know, EP, basically the you know, reticular endothelial system. In fact, any nanoparticle you injected in the bloodstream, 70% instantly liver took it up. Uh, this system takes them out. So availability of nanoparticles already very little. Once you get into the tumor in microenvironment, the more you go through the vessel going deep in the tumor, the more it becomes hypoxic, the interstitial pressure starting growing. There's many, many heterogeneity. For example, you have the dense extracellular matrix. In this area, you have a stroma, tumor, stroma cells, and here you have the tightly packed tumor cells. Now you have abnormal vasculature. All these compounding the problem is really uh, big problems. So I would suggest if whoever interested in the, the barrier, look at this review article by my student, Martha Overcheck, and she did a really good job to summarize the field. And what I also want to mention, there is a huge research field going on, trying to understand all this biological barrier on the impact of tumor delivery. What I'd like to drive you probably to take a look with the Professor Warren Chan's group at UOT. What he did is try to, really has been for the last 10 years, has been trying to determine each barrier's impact in the uh, tumor de manual particle delivery. What his approach is different, because if you look at the global context, this two microenvironment is such a complex structures. What Warren's group did is they actually isolate each individual barriers. And the, just assuming everything the same, just only every time they study one barrier, one variation. And although this approach is simplistic, it does give, they may not overall representing the entire structure, but every by every barrier study for the last 10 years, we're actually getting a lot of very useful information. So some of the study uh, we are part of the co-author we collaborate with. One of the examples I want to show you here is we'll all work together, is if the liver take out 70% of the nanoparticle in there, it's because of the copper cell, because of microphage. And there's one thing people forget about it, is in the tumor, the large amount of tumor-associated microphages, they are competing with the tumor cell for nanomyopathy. And most time, the microphage won the battle. So if you even you get into the tumor, they're still taking up by most of the microphages. So the idea is, let's just try to solve the root problem. If we block the, you know, at least partially deplete some of the copper cells, now there will be more nanoparticle available in the blood circulation, the more chance for them to get a tumor. So that's a basically principle. So the idea is we actually study using the colangionic, basically, liposome, essentially 
Uh, this is a very known, very known uh, drug to depleting the microphage. And they put this drug in the liposomal formulation and give to the animal. And you actually study, if you look at about uh, 40, no, at this dose, uh, 0 0.017 dose, milligram per gram dose, you actually see a significant depletion of the copper cells. And after, you know, 120 hours later, they're coming back essentially after a week. You can, so it's not permanently depleting this, uh, this uh, uh, copper cell. It's basically, it's temporary, get them out, then if they will repopulate. So that's taking this advantage of this approach, essentially have the two-step approach. One, you're treating the, age, the microphage, try to deplete some of the microphage. Then after two days, you give them the perfect time to get the most least amount of microphage at present in the liver. Now you, or maybe perhaps in the tumor, now you inject nanoparticle, then you will hope to have more tumor uptake. So this result was kind of interesting because, for example, there is some rel relatively increasing nanoparticle tumor delivery is really proportional to nanoparticle size with this treatment. If you look at the, uh, compare with the treat to the treated sample size, uh, group versus the PBS group, you will see when you have each of the different size, about 50, 100, about 200 nanometer particles, all of them show some improvement in terms of the, uh, how much is, uh, they get into the tumors. Especially useful is probably for large particle. The larger the, larger the particle, the effect is even more. So we said, wow, this is actually cool. This is actually easy because this agent is clinically, you can find a micropage depletion agent clinically used already, so you can try that. The problem is, even this effect is covering in many, many different kind of tumor models. The coronary dose, there is certain threshold. Up to certain threshold, it doesn't go up again. Even you can up to 180-fold increasement in terms of how much getting to the more compared to the without the treatment. Upper limit is about 2% inject dose per gram in this situation. So why, right? You're improving many, uh, surely improve the availability of the blood circulation, of nanoparticle in the blood circulation. But in the end, it's only 2%, right? So it helps solving one problem, it doesn't solve the real problem. So let's look at it, the next one. How about tumor pathology, pathophysiology? So in this paper together with Warren, we did uh, some really um, hard work in analyzing so many histology tissue samples, just counting every single one, just to identify the vascular densities, extracellular matrix tumor, acellular space, and cellular density, to study the tumor volume, where the tumor size grow, to see how that impact them. The answer is very uh, complex. Really don't have, aside from some very crude conclusion you can draw, like smaller particle, yeah, you have more accumulation, when the larger particle, when you have a tumor volume increasing, the larger particle can go in more. But the, 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 the answer is much more complex than that. Uh, essentially, the only conclusion you can get is any nanoparticle design, you have to be tailored considering the tumor pathophysiology. That's actually the, in a high level, that's all you can claim. So if you think the tumor microenvironment is a major problem for the nanoparticle delivery, well, it compounds further if you consider brain tumors. That's when you have the consideration of blood and barriers. A lot of misconception in the nano field, people say that in glioma, the blood and barrier is broken, is disrupted. So all the nanoparticles will go to glioma. And that's where everybody using glioma to test nanoparticle. It is true, but it's also not true. The answer is much complex than that. So it is true, because if you look at this uh, T1 map of the brain tumor, inject with galenian contrast agent, where the agent present is a very nice glioma tumor. This tumor, this means the MI contrast agent can get into these tumors because the BBB is compromised in that portion of the tumors. But if you take the contrast agent away, doing the MI pulse sequence without using contrast agent. Then you're doing MI, well, the tumor is way bigger than actually this. What does this tell you? 
it tells you only portion of the tumor, especially the core center of the tumor, BBB was broken, that's where the area of aging get in nanoparticle can be. But beyond that boundary, there is a lot of tumor cells the nanoparticle don't get in, and their blood brain barrier is intact. That probably can explain to you, because if you look at this uh, schematic diagram, if you look at this, you will see in the glioma case, why the glioma killing so many people is actually they cannot survive them, and there's nothing you can treat them, is because there is a lot of infiltrated tumors, cells, they go into, the, like they really get into, and these infiltrated regions mostly are BBBs intact. So now what do you do? You do surgery, you cut all the tumor, you leave all the cell be behind, you cannot touch them. If you want to give a chemo, BBB was intact, drug cannot deliver, right? So that's why the glioma is such a big problem because you simply cannot deal with it. And that is beyond all the other tumor microenvironment problem for the other, thing, other tumors. Now if you look at this, I go back to this uh, Mada's beautiful diagram. Essentially, for the last 10, 15 years, people are trying so many different ways to come up with the answer how to overcome the, this barrier in the nanoparticle delivery. Majority, I would say summarize in, in terms of strategy-wise, I can summarize in the nanoparticle design strategy, make the nanoparticle design better, or you can do the tumor microenvironment better for nanoparticle delivery too. But in essence, in terms of what's the, you know, the consequence of this other approach, is either try to bypass EPR, or try to make EPR works better, more homogeneously, less heterogeneous. So that's essentially what's the, the, so the field is going. I'm going to give some examples. Essentially, before I go that, this is a quick uh, illustration. You have some surface modification to making the nanoparticle less subjective to uptake by this microphage or the thing. The best example is Dennis Disher in the PET pen, and they published a paper a, year, a number of years ago, which is in the science paper, generated a huge splash. And they're basically using HD 40C, H, HD, uh, HDC, HCD 47, I think, and that's called self-peptide. Essentially, they're using this peptide to code the nanoparticle, and they will, all the microphagocytic pathway, they will not recognize them anymore. They think they're the, this nanoparticle are their own. That's how the virus plays the trick to its patient, right? So they achieve some astonishing result. They're showing up to 120 days, this nanoparticle can circulate in the blood in the mice. That was quite shocking. And certainly there was a huge debate on, on that approach. But regardless, this, this is representing a one of fundamental shift in people trying to making different kind of way to surface modifying the nanoparticle. You also have like, uh, you know, cell media delivery, you can use an exosome, you can use all different kind of way, be very popular. There is also a way to think, if the nanoparticle delivery, if the particle size is too big, why not we make the smaller, then we go to the tumor, now I actually in vivo assemble inside nanoparticle, not only the retina better, and they actually will, will be, the kinetics will work better. Then you also people think about, uh, you know, shrinking in you know, a different way. Then there is a physical method using the pH. You can hear so much about pH sensitive nanoparticle. You have glucinium, basically using the redox, using the hypersemia, using the temperature, using the light, some of the, and ultrasound. Some of them are going to cover our own examples. Then there is a huge group area working on tumor microenvironment. And these are you're talking about for most famous Rux Jin. The, he basically said, I renormalized the vasculature. When the vasculature becomes normalized, then now actually the product, the drug can get in better. You can also say if the extracellular matrix was so dense, for example, in the pancreas cancer case, there was such a dense type matrix, you destroy them. So you kill them. They loosen up. Now the, the tumor microenvironment probably will be more subjective for the drug delivery. And you have the vast, you know, apoptosis induction, you know, you have all these methods. So I'm going to give you a few examples. The first example actually uh, is going to show you is from the Professor Liang Fang Zhen. And he's my friend. He sent me the slide yesterday, so I added it to it. I always like this approach. What he thought is very similar to Dennis Disher's uh, self-peptide idea. What he did 
is even a step further. He said, I'm not going to take in the signal which is showing what I am is not, I'm not a folding molecule. He actually took the red blood cell, took the red blood cell membrane, isolated, and put it into different pieces. Now he put a polymer nanoparticle core mixed together, and these polymer nanoparticles self basically form the nucleus to form a very homogeneous structures coded with rapid red cell membrane with all the protein associated with membrane. He didn't destroy any single one of them. Keep everything of the red cell membrane intact and making, for example, about one red cell, red blood cell, making 3,000 nanoparticles, essentially. That's pretty much the, the, the mass. Once he did that, he showed dramatic improvement in the circulation of the half-life of this, this nanoparticle. And this is basically a very nice TEM imaging showing the red cell blood membrane, not just a bilayer, but with all the protein was associated. And you can see the staining, you can see the polymer core and the cell membrane. So he was actually pushing this uh, platform to a truly astonishing result. And published, not only published uh, so much papers, all of these nature science papers, but also did in the red blood cell, platelet, white blood cell, cancer cell, bacteria, essentially using the same concept. And what's, this, what's actually really shocking me is he was able to bring this one in the cell membrane into a GMP production and the scale up. He has uh, 30 people in the company and working on this. And I think their uh, nano's first product, nano sponge, as a toxin to tracking the competing with red blood cell for the toxin will be in the clinical trial, I think, and the beginning of the, actually in right now, probably the clinical trial already. So give you another example. How about pH? So this is a group in the Dream Wines group in, the, in, the, in China. What they did is very simple idea. What if I taking a pH sensitive, essentially they call it a cluster nanobomb. You have a dendromer, you link with this platinum, then you have this uh, you know, uh, cleavable linker which responds to the pH, then with the pagulation. So the bush side, if you use a neutral pH, then it's like a very simple nanoparticle and with a pagulipid layer. In the tumor pH, then the cleavage will happen, then all this bush will disappear because this was shedding all the coating, now it becomes a nanoparticle. So in this way, they find out from the large size to small size, you can have actually, in the sephoroid structure at the tumor pH, you can have much more improvement in the penetration, and they're showing some improvement in the therapeutic efficacy. So this is a study, a classic study by Zhang Gu in the UCL, UNC, now he's in UCLA. And what he did is actually a little bit step further. He called it nano depot. So he took advantage of two principles. He put a nanoparticle, it's called nano, core shell nanogel, and kept the drug in dye with a polymer matrix, which can be cleaved, laid down by pH and by other things. They kept two drugs. One is the trail, which is for TNF later. The other one is the angiogenesis drug, right? What he has is, he's showing this nano, core shell nanogel is about 20 nanometer size. They're pretty good di distribution into the tumors. Once they're there, because uh, these tumors overexpress the you know, uh, hyaluronic acid uh, enzyme. Basically, these are the HA, uh, HA with molecule, which is uh, suspect to this enzyme. Then they will promote the self-assembly of this particle once they are in the tumor. And so now they form a cluster and stay there, basically almost a facility retention of this one in a long time. Slowly, slowly, when the tumor pH will slowly degrade them, they almost form a reservoir to get the drug to, you know, uh, going out. So this is actually quite a neat approach. I think I have one more example. This is a Mark Saylor's group in San Diego. What he did is, that this one is very interesting, because not only he shows, using the two system nanoparticle system, one is the raw nano rod to show in the photothermal uh, uh, hypersemia, which is making cooking the tumor better. This is the reason I said it's very interesting, is because the improve, basically achieving the hypersemia is very easy. You don't need to go nano rod. You can use the ultrasound, you can use the light, you can use so many things, magnetic field, you can achieve that. What he's showing is, he found out these targeting, which is, L, uh, I think is a LY7, essentially, um, is a lymphatic pep uh, ly tumor lymphatic vessel specific peptide. What's very interesting, this, once this peptide on the doxorubicin, on the other nanoparticle, this peptide binding 
preferentially binding to the tumor, which is already heated. So there is a heating of the tumor generating called P32 receptor. That receptor attracts the particle to get into it. So what the paper's interest is not because of the hypersemia, is a hypersemia lead to biological targeting effect. So there is a, this is a probably the most ex, uh, exciting example in the field, and this is also the furthest has been. This is from Mark Dewhurst at Duke. What they have done is, Dr. Lubinson's problem is you have a lot improved circulation, and you get a Dr. Lubinson in the liposome accumulating the tumor very nicely around the tumor. Even better, because you can have active loading of doxorubicin in liposome. That means you actually have such a high concentration of the drug in the liposome, they become crystallized. Now imagine that. Yes, I can deliver so much molecule into the tumor. They are solid. They don't even dissolve, right? So what happens is they have such an improvement of tumor delivery efficiency, they don't improve the drug efficacy at all, except as a recipient, they change the pharmacokinetics of the drug, make this better. That's why the docs are only approving one cancer treatment, right? So what Mark Dukas did is, he said, no, this is the problem. So how about I make them very easy to, to open up, release the problem? So he introduced lysolipid, where everybody knows doing lipid nanoparticle know if you introduce lysolipid, they're actually very permeable. So in fact, they actually, as soon as they get blood stream, they actually start to dissociate. So what Mark did is interesting. So what he did is, I don't care if it's stable or not. As long as in circulation, if I put the heat in the tumor area, two, one or two degrees further, just a little bit of hypersemia. Now, as soon as you the nanoparticles through the circulation, which is a very fast event, they will actually become activate there and will be dissociated right there, the drug will deliver quickly. So I'm gonna show you this uh, very nice video. And you have this, uh, you know, the, in the stream, this is uh, the, actually the tumor area. You have this nanoparticle circulating and as soon as you're actually introducing some thermal effect, you release the drug. Right? Once the drug released, they actually get into the tumor because a single molecule getting into the tumor way better. That's how they actually treat it. So, that's how the field is evolving. There are many different approaches to try to do this. So I'll give you some example of our own. And this is the, the Mada, who the PhD student who wrote that review articles. But she happened to be the alumni of this Brazilian, this uh, Sao Paulo Biomedical Photonic Schools. So um, it will be a, she sent the regards to all the students here because she loved this school. And, uh, and she's still talking about it. So I'm gonna talk about this is really uh, her work using the photodyne therapy to improve the drug delivery. So no introduction what the PDT is, but just remember the biological mechanism PDT where there's a lot more, you can say apoptosis, vascular obstruction, many other things can happen. So we were not the first group to think about this approach. In fact, uh, my when I was at a PhD in the Rosal Park, the neighboring lab, Tayaba Hassan, not the Tayaba Hassan, sorry, is Barbara Henderson's lab, actually did something very interesting. In fact, uh, J John Snyder is, uh, is my classmate. So, <laughs> so what they did is actually uh, interesting. Uh, they actually put in the PDT using sub PDT. Not the first time they're using sub PDT in order to, sh to destroy the vasculature, tumor vasculature, to improve the drug delivery for the doxo. And what they achieved the result is actually quite fascinating. Regardless of the dose, from even from the 20 milligram per kg to 1.25 milligram per kg, the trend is similar. With or without PDT, they're always changing. So this set is three hours, this is 24 hours, three hours, 24 hours. So every single dose, they actually see the improvement in the nanoparticle accum doxo accumulation in the tumors. And in this case, when you combine the three hours, 24 hours, two dose treatment together, you will see the change is quite remarkable. That's the 2003, and nobody follow up on that. Until in 2015 of fish, uh, Hisaka Kobayashi of NIH came up with uh, the reinventing the concept of uh, photoimmune therapy. And essentially what he did is he put in antibody conjugate with a, with, a, with a porphyrin, not porphyrin, I think serocyanin. Then he said, if I use this one, I can improve P32 
PDT treatment, I can sublethal PDT, I can improve the drug delivery. And in fact, he achieved a lot more uh, actually accumulation in the tumor area. The big problem with Kobayashi approach is the antibody he's using is already nanoparticle. Even you improve the nanoparticle accumulation in the tumor, it's all in the surrounding, in the peripheral, what we call ring effect. In imaging people like to call it the ring effect. They're still in the borderline. So they didn't help the particle or the drug to go to intratumor distribution. So the essence, the intradumor distribution of nanoparticle or drug delivery is probably the most important. So how to solve this problem? Well, Mara's idea is very simple. He said, Lift, what if we combine the two best of the both worlds? If I'm using a targeted photosynthesizer, if I have this targeted photosynthesizer circling long time, making a small molecule synthesizer circling very, very long time, then they will have very maximum capability to get in the tumor and intra distribute the tumor more. Now I have in the drug, right, should be sublethal PDT, now adding the drug, a nanoparticle, now you have more distribution. It is really easy said than done because there is so much involvement on this approach. The first is you have this uh, shield in the bacteriophil, PSMA targeting, because bacteriophil has the best wavelengths. And you show them, but one, you can see the nicely, we have the PSMA positive versus the PSMA negative. Now in cell, now you put in tumor with an isogenic cell line, which is one has a PSMA knocking, the other one naturally doesn't have PSMA. So the PSMA negative here, PSMA positive tumor here, double match, size matched. You will see over the time, even from four hour, you can clearly see the very nice accumulation in the probably PSMA positive tumor. And this is PSMA the inhibitor is in clinic trial, uh, late clinical trial right now, is from Money Pumper from Hopkins. And you see this one indeed can have some PDT effect, sublethal dose. Then you need a lot of optimizations. First, you need optimization for the pretreatment uh, condition. There is many optimization. Basically, the idea is minus two hours, you actually inject the PSMA, you inject the sanitizer after 12 hours, get them accumulation enough. Now I treat at different time point, the 15 minutes, one hour, all the 24 hours. Study a different nanoparticle using go nanoparticle, doxo, organic nanoparticle, essentially cover the entire spectrum of the nanoparticle. Then these are things we actually have to characterize by histology, fluorescence, I see PMS, in vivo fluorescence, and everything, 3D microscopy. So the first parameter is establishing a sub lethal dose. So in, in this case, you basically said, okay, 50 joules a meter square is pretty good, but 100 joules is really killing the cells. So to keep the 50 joules is probably the better. And the vascular effect at the 50 joules, it doesn't change the vascular much, while the 100 really starting to knock down the vasculature. So 50 joules was chosen. Then the next, you have to choose in the optimum fluorescence rate. And these are using another set of the fluorescence rate, essentially to study, we actually find that 79 uh, milliwatts per centimeter square fluorescence rate is probably the better for the comparison, the tumor control with the laser treatment group. And after treatment, you cut them off, tumor out, you can see the, not only see the tumor in Thai uh, structure is red, if you cut in half, you really see the distribution inside. What's well, the next? you have to try it. So we put the porphyrin, we have an organic nanoparticle, we have a smaller size nanoparticle, so we try the, the porphyrin LDL, porphyrin HDL. In this case, you see, even 30 minutes, you can see the tremendous improvement. Because when we give the porphyrin HDL nanoparticle through the EPI effect, it takes at least 12 hours to get an accumulated tumor. Here, 30 minutes, essentially the same as the three hours. Ex vivo showing the same, and this is a very clearly difference between this intratumor distribution, this is all the DAP with screening with the nucleus. You actually can see that one of the laser treatment, the photosynthesizer is almost everywhere in this tumor slice. So that actually looks uh, about, even though the enhancement accumulation is 1.7 fold, but distribution is way better. Now we want to see if we can do the optimum effect time window between pretreatment and nanoparticle injection. You study 15 minutes, one hour, six hours. What is the ideal time point for nanoparticle injection? Because if you do 24 hours, there's no point because EPI effect is already dominant. So that's what we show. And in fact, we were choosing about 15 minutes is really the best. And that's all you needed 15 minutes accumulation. Now you treat the PDT. 
Now actually you give the, in, in give the injection of nanoparticles. After PDD treatment, 15 minutes later, give nanoparticle and it's into threefold enhancement. So this is a collaboration work with Warren Chan's group. He had this uh, done some um, really fundamental work using the clarity, essentially taking to clear out of the, the, you know, the, the tumor tissues with, a, with, a, with essentially get, all, get rid of all the lipid, right? So that makes the mouse almost transparent. And the user, when this technology was first introduced, takes about 15 days, one month to clear the tissue. Nowadays, 48 hours, you can actually do it very well. So you can do high throughput. And what you're showing is, if you with a laser treated with a gold nanoparticle, the gold nanoparticle is everywhere. If you don't use a laser treatment, then it's a very peripheral and not much get in. So this is really because the gold nanoparticle gave also a chance to do ICPMS to confirm the quantitation, so we can do that. So once we do that, next step, we do the drug. As I said, we already know it's a 75, 50 joule semi square, 75, 79 milliwatt per semi square in the, in the forensic rate, and the, the optimal time window is 15 minutes, and you can see clearly the difference, whether the first time, second time, all of them maintain. So that's what we're getting, and using this one to the proof concept, yes, the, the efficacy can be improved. Now, I want you to you use the rest of time to talk about another approach. This is the approach where our work group has been focused on tremendously now. In fact, uh, we have currently four graduate students. Elizabeth already graduated. We have uh, Manisha and Alex, both MD, PhD students, and Kali is uh, another amazing PhD student. We have another graduate student just joined to really using the ultrasound microbubble try to enhance this because we l recognize the limit of light in terms of how to access the tumors, deep tumors. So a little bit of introduction on the ultrasound and the microbubble. Ultrasound is a v clinically already very well used. If you're introducing the microbubble, which is already FDA approved for some imaging, because the microbubble oscillate, and they have this uh, you know, regular you know, nonlinear mode versus uh, you know, the regular mode. The nonlinear mode is really generating this uh, very interesting optical, uh, also some property, acoustic property, can making the very interesting uh, contrast. This is where the gas, they actually have old generation of the microbubble is gas, literally gas, but they don't work very stable. Nowadays, people using a peripheral carbon gas, so they actually ultrasound can last them for at least for a few minutes. So this gas with a different kind of shell, now you have lipid shell, you have polymer shell. Definitive, well, there's two, couple of FDA approved, one is definitive is a lipid shell structures. That's where we're mimicking our study from. So, Ultrasound microbubble not only can enhance the signal of ultrasound signal, but the microbubble has generating tremendous, uh, you know, essentially the buzz is for the drug delivery. Why is that? Because, sorry. Because the, when the microbubble oscillating in the ultrasound frequency in the under pressure, you see that initially you have this, uh, you know, stable cavitation. Once it's oscillated, they actually, once they oscillate, they actually starting to make the movement to actually pressure the blood vesicle to move, you know, flexible. So that is itself it can allow for some drug impermeability improvement. But when this going further and further, I think, okay, now I got it. So when you go into further, further, eventually you will lead to the captivation. They will be burst. Ultrasound will be burst. Bicobubble bubble will burst by under the ultrasound. Then what happened is the the pressure generating you can generate in the jet stream and a shock wave to open about the blood vasculature and the serial junction. And this is almost like a moon, sh you know, shooting the, all the, you know, the stone, all the, you know, just the asteroid shooting the moon. So essentially surface will be like open up. What's interesting is if you do this carefully enough, you can control the damage to the limit to the membrane, to the, to the um, brain mem uh, membrane, not touching the pericomous tumors. Colovo Handling's group in Sunnybrook, and uh, with, together with Peter Burns and all the physics, ultrasound physics group, they have done this for like the uh, last 20 years. They finally figured out what is the best parameter to FDA allowed, which is uh, basically it's healthy, is can open this blood brain barrier, endocellular junction, and they can reseal after 12 hours. 
and not damaging the brain tumors. They take an enormous amount of work, but they were now in clinic already in a phase one trial to achieve that. This is one of the classic example. In the MI contrast, if you have this one, this is before the microbubble ultrasound bursting. After bursting, you will see the tremendous improvement of the nanoparticle doxo delivery, the contrast, so as nanopart delivery. So that's where the potential come from. So what's my group coming is we try to solve two problems. First, microbubble within the vasculature is not very well, you know, are well characterized. But what happened beyond the vasculature really is a big mess. Nobody knows, right? The because is once you bubble burst, they no longer, you know, sensitive to ultrasound. There is no signal anymore. Everything people follow are static after 24 hours. They follow up what happened to the residue of them. But nobody knows the dynamic conformation, dynamic what happened to this micro bubble. And second, there is a lack of really time tracking or quantifying the, essentially the micro in vivo fate. People don't even know what's happened to the shell weather. As long as the reason why this is okay for the current micro bubble, because current micro bubble is harmless. It's a gas plus a lipid. They, if they got trapped in the lung, they are harmless. Imagine the micro bubble now, people try to attach all the drug to it. Some of them going to trap in the lung. Then that's the consequence people actually didn't think about it. That's why it is more important than ever to do real-time tracking. So I mentioned in yesterday's lecture, I have a tease of this. We actually have this uh, porphyrin micro bubble. Introducing the porphyrin lipid into this micro bubble. And we have this uh, very nice microbubble structures. You give you a different way to do the optical readout. What's interesting is we actually did further than that. We make a J aggregation, the high order structure as mentioned yesterday, to actually make the porphyrin assembly structure within this microbubble structure. Then what happened is they have one wavelength. When they actually become bursted, if you become monomer, that's one wavelength. If you remain some sort of high order structure, like a nano, like aggregate, then it remain the optical property they actually retain. So using this as optical readout with the photoacoustic, we actually, all fluorescence, we actually can identify what happened to the micro bubble afterwards. So take advantage of this phenomena, we're able to show in the uh, couple of years ago, we will show this the first time. People suspect this all the time. Micro bubble bursted by ultrasound, they become nanoparticle, all time solid residuals. But nobody observed that. And we were able to show the microbubble actually become nanoparticle after ultrasound bursting. Right? And that's actually very interesting because the way we actually demonstrate is by showing after injecting IV, basically you were infusion this time. We don't use bolus, we just infusion. One or two minutes later, we basically put the ultrasound on the tumor site, massage them, right? Then what happened, the bubble bursted. We actually see the nanoparticle get actually the, 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 purple, the porphyrin component get into the tumor, and they stay there. Why is that? If it's a single porphyrin molecule, they will wash out eventually. But because they actually form nanoparticles, they stay, they maintain the optical signals. That if you look at this, even after two hours, we have 60% re retention of the photoacoustic signals. That means we confirmed that it is not only bubble bursted, you have the porphyrin get into the tumor, they actually form nanoparticle right there. So that's pretty exciting because that's opened up a new way to kind of almost like a feel like a, um, artificially manipulate the EPI effect because we no longer rely on the biological consequence of the nanoparticle. But more than that, so this is the idea. So if we, one thing is we can have EPI dependent delivery of the nanoparticle. Also we can say if you have a porphyry nanoparticle form inside the vasculature or form inside tumor. Now you have a chance to do PTT or sonodynamic for that sake. Sonodynamic is ultra sensitizing by ultrasound, but it's a really murky field. Nobody studied fundamental it because really nobody knows where these things happen in the vasculature or in the vascular or in the, or in the tumor. Not only that, it's very limited to know these nano, these uh, form these uh, sonodynamic uh, sensitizers is because once you're in the micro bubble field, almost like uh, I want to use analogy like a uh, ramen surface enhancement. Surface enhancement is a lot of things caused by the hotspot. 
hotspot dominant the surface enhancement. In here, the situation, if you have a smaller size of nanoparticle, which have all just acoustic signal, like acoustic, echogenic like liposome, versus a microbubble, the microbubble signal we dominant everything. So a few microbubble can exclude your entire process. So that's why we need a fundamental studies. So collage together with a Clovel and his group and uh, Dave Gertz group at Sunnybrook, we actually launched a major program in the ultrasound in terms of physics, try fundamentally try to stand the whole process. So you need a setup, for example, this is ultrasound setup. You can actually do the both the, you know, first of all, you actually uh, ultrasound ex uh, 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 radiation, you have a therapeutic ultrasound versus the imaging ultrasound. And what's the first indication we got is interesting, is we observed the echogenic signal, the nanobubble we observed. So what that means is not only microbubble become nanoparticle after ultrasound bursting, they become nanobubble with gas. That limit kind of option, right? You no longer form a self-assemble there. You basically either shed it, some of the structure, you still keep the gas, some of them, or you become shrink, right? Some gas leakage. And we have done many different, you know, systematic study. I'm trying to understand this using the, for example, the two photon window chamber microscope, and they actually give some really nice uh, uh, image, and really we can tracking what happened to this microbubble upon the ultrasound conversion. They actually can actually activate and the two different scenarios. So these are the major program we're working on. So I think the final piece of, okay, I'm going to quickly so. I promise to leave more time for discussion. So this is basically the, for the, my physics, physics friend here. And uh, don't ask me too much about this, because uh, even though I'm the, uh, I got a grant for this, I don't know a lot of these studies. My bottom line is what, um, what Kali dem demonstrate, for the first time, we observed nonlinear acoustic scattering property for the nano, nano bubble in the vasculature and in the tissue fenty at a clinical relevant frequency. <laughs> This is really the key figure. The paper is already published. And you will see this is a big difference. In the nano bubble, we can see that under the pressure, they actually have a threshold. As soon as you're reaching the threshold, it shows up, right? Because if you, people are showing the nano bubble can do ultrasound imaging, but most of them are truly not very useful because they're not nonlinear scattering property. And this is nonlinear property. So for those that are interested in ultrasound physics, uh, take a look at this paper. So the final point I want to mention is how can we track them? I'm a, ultimately, I'm an imaging guy, so I like tracking everything. I want to find everything to quantify everything by imaging method. And remember, we do have some very unique properties. We have a copper 64, can go to the porphyry. So we want to do the quantitation, because in the blood circulation or in the, in the whole body, the optical is a little bit limited. So what we did is you take advantage of this property, really study try to find the copper chelation strategy that does not change the physical property of this microbubble that we have accomplished. Basically showing the up to 30% powerful lipid uh, inclusion, we have pretty much the same, every size and concentration, the same as definitive. So that's actually, it have to be similar to the commercial bubble. Second, we show the yield of chelation is very robust. Whether you have different chain of the, 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 the ultrasound the layers, the microbubble layers, we have very, very high 95% radiochemical purity, and the signal of this one is very robust. And we use this method, we're able to do the quantifying the pharmacokinetics. I have to emphasize this is not a microbubble pharmacokinetics. It is a shell material of the microbubble, shedding from the microbubble. But nevertheless, we're able to show, you actually can see the very nicely from one hour to three, four, and five hours, eventually by six hours, you know, essentially everything was got washed out. So this allow us to some really nice chance to do the uh, more study on the study, this ultrasound based micro to nano conversion. Essentially, this is basically what a conclusion is. Harnessing this micro to nano conversion is really providing a tool to enhance drug delivery and to help the uh, maybe potentially photodyne therapy and solodyne therapy. So I want to end with, uh, uh, we are mentioning about all the over nano barriers, but there is another important part I missed, didn't talk about anything, is the immune therapy. Nano interaction with immune therapy. I don't have time, this is probably, if I have a fourth lecture, this is what I'm gonna talk about. But I encourage you to read this review article, which is nicely written, very comprehensive, huge article by Jenny, 
my student here. She will still be here for the next few days. And the paper is already out online, so and take a look. Really huge amount of work in the nano and interface with immune therapy. So final take home message. I don't want to scare you to not doing nano anymore because I talk about all the all hurdles. But you have to keep you optimized. The reason is there is so much a boom of the nano medicine in the phase one clinical trial. Five years ago, maybe one or two trials. Now it's like 30, 40. I think it will be mushroom very quickly. Because people are recognizing this problem and starting to address this, directly address these, these hurdles. And so be encouraged, don't be discouraged. That's why my home final message. And thank you. Good, I have 10 minutes now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Thank you very much, Prof, for the nice talk. I would like to know uh, from uh, Professor Kobayashi's theory of uh, the EPR and how to overcome this. Uh, was, it, was the limitation due to the bulky size of the maniclonal antibody uh, being restricted to the blood vessels? And was your pretreatment uh, improved the nanoparticle uh, uh, treatment uh, by the extraction of the vasculature and access of the nanoparticle to the tumor? It's a good, quite very good question. What Kobayashi did is also number one, he also did a sublethal dose of PDT. So we also did a sublethal dose PDT. Number two, he basically uh, are also using a very fast time window after PDT treatment for nanoparticle delivery. So I will suspect our mechanism of the nanoparticle getting to the tumor area, the amount of improvement in the nanoparticle getting is similar. My problem of, I think the, the disadvantage of their approach is the antibody themselves is huge, about 12, like 10 or 5 to 12 nanometer, would you want to name them for it? And this making their conjugate, porphyrin conjugate to the antibody, they stay around the tumor area. They don't get into the tumor deeply. So even though you can destroy some vessel, get them into that, it still doesn't improve the intratumor distribution which is ultimately most important for therapeutic. For imaging, nobody cares. It works. For thermal, it works, because the thermal gradient can carry over. But if you want the drug, chemotherapy drug, that doesn't work. Hi. Um, some um, small comments and questions concerning the EPR effect. We actually published on uh, 2010 um, the uh, accumulation of uh, RGD bacterial chlorophyll uh, WST11 actually conjugates in the uh, uh, tumor models of the uh, triple negative uh, breast cancer. And the idea there was that the single molecules uh, have been conjugated with uh, an RGD that got attached to the integrin receptor. So each of the single molecule that was attached to the serum albumin, as I described in the previous lecture, got actually into place with the different cells uh, of the tumor and, and had both um, very good uh, impact on the visioning of the tumor and also on the destruction. Now, when you have a large nanoparticle that the whole nanoparticle is conjugated with uh, an antibody, actually the major problem will be um, the dissolution of the single molecules. Now, what prevents them of going out of the tumor? Well, first of all, everything before the last part is absolutely right on, right? That's what's essentially, uh, in fact, the Matsurula and the Maida did the original study is Evans Blue conjugating with albumin. And he, they demonstrated- Yeah, but they, that, that's exactly the difference between they conjugated the albumin yeah. permanently, covalently, which yeah. I think is a big mistake because then you can have both toxicity yeah. and, the, and the problem in getting I the totally compound. I totally agree, I totally agree. Yeah. That's the reason why there is so much example. They're trying to get it, like using click and all the basic cleavable linker. They try to get in there. As soon as they get in, they separate. Then essentially, these are the big to small approach, this in vivo disassemble approach. Essentially, there is a, so many different kind of way. People recognize this. That's why I think it's exciting about nanomedicine now. Because people recognize this issue. The nanoparticle get into there because of the size. But now you have a new different, all the, all the different approach 
try to get in there and share the nanoparticle, then it becomes either they become a single molecule or no, they but become but that, a cluster. Therefore, I'm asking what prevent the single molecules the single molecules are uptake by the cancer cells or other oh, cells. Because the, how is it prevented? It's because the nanoparticle, the size, prevents them to get into tumor distribution. So unless they no, become shielded what? from the cell molecule, they will not be able single. If it's not single molecule, they will not be able to no, get. No, I, I'm asking what prevents the single molecule of being washed out of the tumor through the uh, blood vessels. No, because if I they are not big enough, they will not stay there. Yes. They will be washed out like any, any yeah. particles, though. That's exactly the similar to the example I gave for the porphyrin microbubbles, right? If you have formed a porphyrin individual molecule, it will be washed out. But if you form some sort of remnant, and they actually can stay. So you can actually take advantage of both the EPI effect and also have the small molecule behaviors. So you need to somehow to make them form, form example, small molecule formed aggregates, for example, then they stay in the tumor lung. Which means that each of the small molecules should be uptake by the cancer Either cells. Either they uptake or they somehow allowed them to stay longer to yes. be uptake later. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> Prof, please, as a solution to EPR, yeah. the priming of the tumor microenvironment, I want to know how you intend to normalize the vasculature of the tumor. Okay. So there is a, this is a Rakesh James work. Uh, started a um, number of years ago, essentially to using this uh, anti-angiogenesis uh, you know, drug to renormalize re the vasculature. The idea is they try to take care of the interstitial pressure. When does the interstitial pressure build up, whatever the drug get in, they will be pushed out. And by changing the abnormal vasculature into normalized vasculature, they will decrease the interstitial pressure not only the hypoxic issue, but only, I think, is interstitial pressure issue, they will allow them to get in the, get in the side more. We actually are working on this approach right now in combination of photoline therapy. That's a mother's work. He has, she actually showed combination of the normalized vascular normalizing agent further improve that PDT enhanced the drug delivery. Thank you. Yes? Uh, thank you for the lecture, but mm -hmm. I... My question is, what happened with the nanoparticles after the treatment or after the diagnostic? What happened after, after you do the transport of the perfinin like Can you s re rephrase that question? I didn't get it. What happened yeah. with the nanoparticles after in the body, uh, after the treatment? She's accumulate or she's eliminate? They eliminate? Uh, after the treatment or the diagnosis, what happens with the nanoparticle? Oh, after the, so. Uh, the treatment that. Which particular you want to talk about? So after the treatment, so probably the best example is Doxo, right? Doxo carries so much drug, they get into the tumor. So after the lung circulation, the EPI effect. And the original doxo has active loading with all the drug, and they become solubilized as a crystal. Because they actually is precipitated. Actually, that's considered success, because you can, nobody can load so much drug into a nanoparticle ever before. Through active loading, you have so much drug loaded, then become crystal. You actually can see some of the um, Ian Tanox's work in my institute have some very seminal work, really showing the layer-by-layer -layer distribution of the drug, because doxolubins happen to be fluorescent. So they actually see a way the vasculature, see a way from the, you can look at this search of the Ian Tanak paper. You will see this is really almost formed like a, a layer of the fluorescence only along the vascular layer. So nowadays, everybody try to solving the release problem, not the accumulation problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah. More questions? Thank you, Dr. Zhang, for the lovely talk. Uh, my question is related to the J uh, porphysomes. So how, so uh, yeah. it is known that the porf porphyrins in itself, they can form either H aggregates yes. or J aggregates. Yes. So how do you define the parameters to get the preferential J aggregation rather than the It's H? It's a great question. That bring me to my first acknowledgement that uh, we were not the first to make the porphyrin-like structures. 
Japanese did it, beat us like 20 years back. What they did is they actually, by conjugating the porphyrin structures with a porphyrin, one porphyrin with a bunch of lipids, essentially. Instead of one porphyrin, one lipid, they were able to form only the edge aggregate of the porphyrin. They don't call it a porphyrin, that's why they got, we, we got a name, because we, they didn't use them. But they were designed that for the cyclone C oxidase model. They did because it's almost like a pick fence, right? So they form a purely edge aggregate. Our porphyrin structure is like this. Their porphyrin structure is completely opposite. So by changing the chemistry, you can make all sorts of different way of porphyrin nanoparticles. We just didn't get so busy on the porphyrin, we haven't got a chance to explore others. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, just a short comment concerning okay. uh, Rakesh Jain. Um, the point actually that the Avastin completely failed yeah. in, uh, in doing whatever they wanted, namely to destroy the uh, cancer through uh, obstruction of the uh, vasculature. And therefore what they find out that actually it normalizes the major blood vessels, enabling chemotherapy to go in. So this was not so much on um, occlusion of materials within the tumor, but rather the other way around, making the uh, porous blood vessels become normalized, good blood vessels, so that they can deliver the uh, chemotherapy. And the, um, actually, the use of Avastin alone caused also metastasis. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, this was quite a disaster that is not so much talked about. I agree. I completely agree. That's, how, that's actually the fascinating about it. Okay. Let's thank your game, Professor. <laughs>